<clears throat> so William, what do you do or work on when you're not uh, presenting to the meetup? <laughs> um, so I work at a company called Compass. It's like a real estate tech startup. Um, so I specifically, I work on mostly data ingestions and data pipelines. Uh, so okay. basically we're pulling, we're in like 80 different geographies now. So we're pulling in like real estate listing data in, in all of those areas. And the data is pretty varied. And uh, I guess there's a standard protocol, which is nice, but it's also kind of old and like XML based. And then uh -huh. each, each area like has their own schema. So even though we can kind of query it, in similar ways, it still takes a lot to uh, to figure out how to like bring on these new feeds, and then you know, doing it at scale. Like I think at this point we get like a couple hundred thousand updates a day, and we're like constantly kind of adding new places. So uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what I work on. Um, we just started a very small like AI machine learning team at work, and I think they're trying to figure out projects. So. Huh. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have something to talk about soon in that. Yeah, I mean, we brought our we had a new CTO join in like November, December, and he came from uh, he was CTO of Cloud AI at Microsoft, I think, okay. um, involved in that there. So he he's kind of brought uh, some of that over uh, in terms of wanting to kind of uh, develop more of those. But before that, we didn't really have much uh, machine learning. Okay, and is the the uh, you doing the, the company is it what's the kind of product or angle is it kind of like Zillow Redfin kind of in that space or something else it's a little bit different so it's it's kind of modeled as a traditional brokerage from like a kind of revenue perspective so we do have I think we're at 10,000 12,000 agents who are like compass agents and who are out there uh, meeting clients selling homes and then on the okay. tech side we're basically building tools to basically empower them and, and power their workflows. So uh, a lot of the stuff is like marketing center is like a big product. So they can kind of generate auto generate a lot of their marketing materials and CRM contact management, um, that, that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, basically trying to help the, the agents get out there and sell, um, mostly on the agent side. I mean, on the consumer side, we still like compete with Zillow and Redfin for like traffic. Like mm -hmm. we, we'd love to have more people visiting the site. So it's kind of interesting. We're kind of caught between like, we have to compete with the brokerages uh, in like selling uh, the houses, but then we also compete with Zillow and Redfin and the like in terms of actually having the data and have people actually want to visit the site and find out about listings. So. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Cool. Uh, so I will just start running through our standard agenda, but I think we'll, yeah. uh, we will tweak it a little bit for this session. Um, so hey everyone, I'm Sam, Sam Charrington, host of This Week in Machine Learning and AI podcast. Excited to have William uh, on the line. William Horton will be delivering our main presentation, which is on averaging weights leads to wider optima and better generalization. Uh, we have been chatting here, waiting for folks to continue to join in and we'll continue doing that. We usually reserve the first part of the meetup for, uh, open conversation, uh, and we will continue to do that. And then around the quarter after, so another, uh, five, seven minutes or so, I'll hand the reins over to William to bring us into the main presentation. Uh, quick word on upcoming meetups. Uh, in the beginning of May, we do two meetups uh, a month, not counting the study group that we do uh, on Saturdays. The, uh, early in the month, we do the EMEA meetup that's at 7 p.m. Uh, Central European summertime. The next one will be on May 2nd, and that will be uh, the presentation there is on prototype based classifiers in the presence of concept drift. Uh, and the presenter will be Philip Packmore. And then uh, in about a month on the 15th of May, same time is the Americas meetup and our presenter will be Jidin Dinesh and he'll be presenting 
putting on Bert. Bert is one of the uh, one of the models for uh, it, it's kind of become popular in natural language processing. Um, so looking forward to both of these upcoming meetups. Uh, William, so you know, um, you know, feel free to go through your presentation. I'll kind of keep track of questions in the chat. Uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to either unmute and just shout them out or uh, chime into the chat and I will make sure uh, William sees them or, you know, find a, a place to inject them. Uh, and of course, this meetup depends on your participation. So uh, we've got a standing call for presenters up at twomalaya.com slash meetupcfp. And we are always looking for presenters. That form will allow you to submit your interest uh, in presenting to both the EMEA and America's meetups. And we encourage you to do that. Uh, and so we've got a couple minutes for community discussion, and uh, this is basically our open mic session. Um, we uh, can talk about things that you have seen and are interested in chatting about from recent uh, podcasts, uh, things you've seen in the news, uh, the, the AI news that is, not the political news. <laughs> Uh, stuff you're working on that's interesting, yeah, you name it. If it's uh, related to machine learning and AI, we can talk about it uh, for the next few minutes. Anyone have any interesting things they've seen to get us kicked off? I'm not up on my AI news the past. I've been traveling like crazy. Just go. I'm here in New York City. Uh, as most of you know, I'm based in St. Louis, but I'm here in New York City for a couple of days for a conference. Uh, the in this case, the O'Reilly AI conference, uh, which isn't particularly a news-oriented uh, event. There's not usually a lot of announcements here, so no news from that. But I've not caught much. Uh, I think the last thing last week I was at. Uh, a Qualcomm event, they were announcing a new forthcoming uh, chip for inference that they will be working on. And this, of course, is before uh, the news, was it today or yesterday? I forget already, um, that uh, Qualcomm and Apple settled their longstanding uh, suit over Qualcomm's licensing and modem and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the Qualcomm folks will have even more of Apple, Apple's money to invest in AI inference chips. <laughs> any other, uh, any interesting, what, what have you all seen? I, I've mostly been working with the, the Stillern models, trying to understand some of the, when it comes to inference, you know, there are a number of methods now that people are trying to develop to make inference faster. Mm -hmm. And Intel has a project called a distiller. Distiller? Uh, Google distiller, that's their Nirvana system is one of their uh, mm -hmm. toolkits. I'm trying to understand it better and how it performs. Uh, today, Google released something called MorphNet, mm -hmm. which is sort of a compiler of the idea, again, trying to take an existing neural network and optimize it so it's smaller. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I, mean, I, I know some of the clients I deal with, they say, like, they've been trying to retrain GP2, mm -hmm. uh, which is this thing, and they, uh, you know, it's too big. You know, they need more hardware. So yeah. it's, a, it's an issue. It actually is an issue. It doesn't seem like it would be an issue, but it's, uh, so I just kind of the stuff I've been digging into is understanding some of the details of, you know, whether this stuff is useful or not. You know, we do a lot of natural language processing and, you know, things like BERT and GP2 are really, really big models. And, do they really need to be that big? Right. It takes well, a lot of you hardware don't even have the big, the big uh, GPT-2. <laughs> well, they're, they're my client, the guys at my old client, they're rerunning the big one. Like oh, they, really? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they built their own. They, okay. They, GP-2 is just more of GP. Right, GPT-2 right. is just bigger. So they just they just coded it up, and, you know, they're trying to run it, and they found that when they large, like, they run large batch sizes, and they said it crashes the hardware. I said, well, you should run smaller batch sizes because you get better accuracy. I didn't know that. So, okay, so, you know that's this kind of stuff, you know. But it, it, these yeah. are, uh, you know, it's a trade-off because these things, uh, 
you, you can't run large batch sizes because, well, it screws up the accuracy, but also you don't have the memory. Right. But when you run small batch size, you know, it might take, you know, six months. Through. Who knows how long it'll take to run? It might cost, you know, right. it might call, it might, you know, bankrupt the company. So, you know, it's mm -hmm. uh, getting these things smaller is, is interesting. And I've, I've started to take more interest in this. And uh, uh, so it's, yeah, but they're just running it themselves. You know, they said, let's just retrain it yourself. What's the big deal? So seems like it's, all it. go ahead. I was going to say, it seems like there's been a lot of, to your original point, there's been a lot of interest of late in this whole uh, compiler, neural network compiler space. So you mentioned the distiller and the, the Google announcement, and uh, there was, there are quite a few of these. I think Facebook maybe has one and Microsoft. A lot of them are centered around, like, uh, you have Onyx uh, as this kind of open uh format for specifying these networks and then being able to uh, compile them to uh, to run optimally on on different hardware. Uh, AWS came out with one at reInvent. There's a lot of a lot of stuff happening in that space. Yeah, yeah I would imagine that um, you know Intel wants to sell their chips mm -hmm. and you, you need to optimize things for the chips uh, and uh, you know, it's a funny thing because you you optimize the neural network and its behavior changes. It's not like it's not like code. Although I, I had worked years ago with you know hardware engineers who said they didn't trust compilers mm -hmm. <laughs> that the compiler could break the you could break code. You have to do things by hand. They would code everything and literally code everything in hex. Uh, <laughs> I, I met a guy years ago. We worked I worked at a packet sniff, like a company that was do packet sniffing. I feel like you're just showing off now. <laughs> no, no, I was crazy. He never seen. Um, he'd never seen Git in post, like from HTTP. He'd only coded it in hex. He didn't know that. <laughs> he didn't know that there was like you know Git and post. Like he didn't know what that was. <laughs> so I always see the hex code, but it's the same thing. Like because these are like your know, hardware guys. You know they don't know right. this stuff. It's amazing. Right. I was amazed. Like you got to be kidding. Because oh, I don't. I don't know what this is. Um, That's funny. That's but, pretty you know, funny. It's the same thing here. You know these things. You like with the distiller stuff. It's weird. You know we. You know, we have a theory which tells us why network should improve and you run the distiller stuff and it breaks the theory and it's like mm -hmm. it does weird stuff and it's not clear whether it's not clear like whether these things would say be more subject to adversarial attacks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, does this maybe we can, with, go ahead. I was going to say, maybe we can take this uh, topic and have someone present a paper on why these compilers work or don't. Uh, but it's probably a good time to transition to William uh, and his topic. Uh, if you don't, haven't already pulled that paper, uh, this is the, the link on archive. But William, you want to try to uh, to share your screen? Yes, I will. Okay. All right. You can see my screen now? Yep. OK, great. Uh, let me just go to, let me just present here. Okay, great. So you, you can see that. <laughs> cool. Okay. So yeah, this is the paper averaging weights leads to wider optima and better generalization. They're the authors. Uh, I'm William Horton uh, presenting this for the Twin online meetup. Excited to get to talk about this paper. Um, which, which last year I kind of discovered and was able to do an implementation of and do some experiments with. Um, just a note, this paper, the paper title is a little bit long, but a lot of people know the, the method better. So this method is stochastic weight averaging or SWA. And this is the paper that int introduced it. So if you've ever seen that, um, that's also referring to this paper. Uh, and uh, my experience with this paper, if you can believe it, it started with a tweet. Um, so this is one of the authors of the paper, and he tweeted out uh, about the archive link. Uh, and then it was mentioned uh, that Jeremy Howard might add it to the Fast AI library. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is really how, uh, how it started. And I saw these tweets. And at the time, I was an international fellow uh, doing the Fast AI course. And I was like, uh, you know, I don't have to wait till Jeremy adds it. Like I could add it. Uh, and they kind of encourage you to take on projects like that. And so I, I saw this and I said, okay, I'll read the paper and, uh, and see what I can 
do with it. So to tell you a little bit about me, uh, I'm a software engineer working with data pipelines and data infrastructure at Compass, which is a real estate technology company. I'm a perennial fast AI student, uh, starting with, I didn't participate in the V1 of it, but watched the videos for those and then have been an international fellow or remote for the version two and now the current version three uh, Kaggle competitor. Uh, in general, I'm really passionate about making deep learning accessible to software engineers because that's kind of the background I'm coming from uh, and kind of got hooked into it uh, through fast AI and some other online resources. And uh, I think it's you know really cool and uh, great to learn about this stuff. So uh, yeah, that's kind of where I came from when I first came across this paper. And so, yeah, this is the paper from archive. Uh, I opened it up and, uh, and got started. So to give you a little bit of, of background uh, about the paper, I'm gonna go through two other papers that kind of give you the necessary context to understand what they uh, are gonna talk about and kind of where they were coming from. Uh, and so in general, this is all situated in the area of ensembling. So ensembling, it can be as simple as just taking the average of several different models. So you train your models, you make predictions, you average those predictions. There's more complicated ways to do it, especially if you're on Kaggle. Uh, you might be familiar with some of these because there can be some pretty um, kind of crazy methods, but you can do voting across your models. You can start taking weighted averages or doing some kind of stacking or building models on top of the outputs of your models. Um, but one of the downsides of all these approaches most approaches to ensembling is that you have to train multiple models. So say you want to average them, you might train three or five, and maybe you tweak the initialization or you tweak some of the hyperparameters to generate kind of a diversity in your ensemble, but you're still having to pay the training cost of, of doing that uh, multiple times. And so the question uh, that a couple papers start to get into is, can we ensemble more efficiently? Uh, and so one of the first ones to look at that uh, was snapshot ensembles, and in the title it even says, train one, get M for free. Uh, and so this was a paper that started looking into, can we do more efficient ensembling? And they said, basically, it seems almost contradictory, but you can actually ensemble multiple networks with no additional training costs. Uh, and so how did they manage to do this? So if we can look at it, basically a diagram from the paper they have of the regular uh, gradient descent process. Um, you know, you're starting maybe on one of these peaks and you're taking these little steps and you're eventually hoping to wind up in one of these minima to get to one of the low points. Um, and you can see as you're going through this process, you're, traverse, you're traversing a, a decent portion of this lost surface. So if you start to think about the loss as a landscape or a surface, you're basically going over a lot of it before you end up at your final point. Uh, and so that's the behavior that you can start taking advantage of to uh, maybe generate candidates while you're moving along that training path. Uh, and so the key to this in the snapshot ensembling paper uh, ends up being cosine and kneeling with restarts. Um, and so basically you apply a cosine uh, curve to your learning rate uh, and you end up um, basically being able to get it down to these kind of valleys of training loss, and then you restart and bump the learning rate up very high again, uh, and then you kind of train it back down into the valley. Uh, and that's basically what this chart is showing compared to, uh, if you look at the blue line, it's a standard learning rate schedule. You see the loss is a more gradual decrease, and then it kind of jumps down, um, but it's not having kind of these, uh, dips and so those dips uh, end up being what you can take advantage of and and snapshot essentially to take uh, to make your ensemble and so uh, each one of these with the dashed line uh, is basically taken as a separate model and then used in the ensemble uh, and so you can see in this diagram then that uh, compared to the first one where we basically go through the landscape and end up in one spot um, in the second one we go to one spot and then basically bump up. By bumping up the learning rate, we're able to basically escape that one and get into another one uh, and then in the same way. So here we actually end up with three models and you can see those three models all reach some kind of minima and together they might be better than the single minima we reached through stochastic gradient ascent. So basically the paper saying, 
we're wasting computation by throwing away the weights from the middle of the training because if we can just get the learning rate schedule to be right, if we can tweak that, we can basically explore uh, areas of the loss landscape uh, and maybe put some of those together uh, instead of just satis like being satisfied with having only one model at the end of it all. So that's that was snapshot ensembling. Uh, and then this paper, loss surfaces, mode connectivity, and fast ensembling of DNNs, this shares uh, authors with the paper I'm gonna talk about with the SWA paper. Uh, and basically it is another one that starts to look at kind of the loss landscape uh, and try to understand the, the geometric properties of it. And the main result of this paper was saying, if you look at these minima, uh, you know, it can be hard to visualize a, a way of getting between them. Uh, and obviously this is only like a 3D graph, um, but because the weight space is in so many dimensions, basically the result of this paper was to say that we can actually find a curve that takes us between those points uh, and along that curve, the training and test accuracy are gonna be nearly constant. So once we've reached a point that is say a pretty good minima, we can also then travel along a curve that keeps us around that same loss, uh, but goes to other parts of the weight space. And, and we can take advantage of that again to do some efficient ensembling. Um, so this is what they call mode connectivity. It's how the minima are connected. And to kind of try to understand this graph, basically the horizontal axis is fixed. Um, and then the vertical axis represents different planes. And basically the visualization is to show um, that depending on basically the plane you're in or the kind of dimensions that you travel through, um, it, it affects the loss between different minima. So on the left side here, um, you can see these three points might be where three of your models ended up in training. And you can see that traveling between them would take you out of the good space and, and put you in an area which has much higher loss. Um, but then if you look at it in different dimensions, um, you basically can try to discover curves that take you through an area where the loss is basically the same. So in the middle here, this is a Bezier curve. Uh, and then on the right here, this is basically, they call it a polygonal chain with one bend. Uh, and so you, you travel this line and then it bends once and you can end up here. Uh, and so this is one of the, the main results of the paper is basically, first of all, figuring out how do we, if we have two modes, if we have two trained models at, at minima, how do we travel between them to, uh, to be able to stay within this good space? And then they take that and they take that as inspiration for the ensembling method they propose, um, which is called uh, FGE. And basically it again uses cyclic learning rates and it basically says, well, instead of training two models, and ending up with two minima, we know that there has to be this line. We, we know that this line exists that can get us to another one. Uh, and basically by using cyclic learning rates, we can simulate finding that line between them without having to have the second point. And so that's kind of the other main result of this paper is to say uh, by using this kind of schedule, so we have a learning rate, we go down um, we're basically moving away from the minimo that we found, but ensuring that we stay along one of, or I mean, not literally staying along one of those paths, but trying to find an approximation of those paths from our single network. Uh, and so that's kind of what this paper found. And, and like I said, this shares authors with the SWA paper. So to get into the, the root of the paper we actually want to talk about. Um, so stochastic weight averaging. This is the algorithm. Um, and so this algorithm actually, a lot of it is just describing stochastic gradient descent. So basically you have a model with weights. This is one part is you're keeping a model for SWA. Uh, and then for a number of iterations, 
you calculate your learning rate, you do an update. And then this is kind of the key piece here is um, you keep this running average according to the number of models you've already seen and you update the weights uh, to be the average of the models that uh, you've already seen. So to put it in plain words, you first make a copy of the model. So this is WSWA in the uh, algorithm here. And then basically at each, after each epoch, we update the weights of the copy according to this equation. And this equation is the, just the equation for keeping a running average. So after one iteration, it'll be the weights of the first model. After two iterations, it'll be an average of the two, after three, et cetera. So this is keeping a running average of the weights as we travel through the space uh, of like gradient descent. And so, you know, that might seem like a simple algorithm, um, but there's a few wrinkles that they throw in in terms of training to actually get this all to work. Uh, and the first one is learning rate schedules. Um, so they play around with cyclic learning rates as well as some constant learning rates um, to basically make sure, in, in, similar to the FGE paper, to make sure that it's actually being able to explore these spaces. Because uh, that's kind of central to the whole idea that we can um, average uh, these models is that we're actually generating good models after each iteration. Uh, another piece uh, that makes it a little bit tricky is you obviously, or not obviously, but you probably don't want to start with your first iteration and start averaging from there. Um, because your first iteration is going to be very far away from the minima. Like you haven't even gotten close. and so. It's, it's not really uh, worth to count that toward your exploration. And so in all of their experiments, basically, they have some pre-training phase before they start applying this SWA rule. Um, basically, before they start keeping the running average, they might say do 75% of the training before we actually start keeping the average. And the idea is that after that 75%, the weights have gotten close enough to the minima in the weight space that it's worth to start uh, taking this average. Um, and another, another piece is uh, cyclic learning rates, which I kind of talked about before. Um, but when training with cyclic learning rates using SWA, um, the trick is you only want to take the, uh, you only want to average in the models that are at the minimum learning rate. Uh, and so basically you'll be going down and at the bottom, that's where you're going to find the model of the best loss. So you keep that and average it in. So if you have, say, four cycles, it would be the average of those four, um, which is kind of similar to uh, snapshot ensembling, except that um, SWA is averaging in the weight space. So that's kind of the difference there is a lot of previous techniques had said we can average in the prediction space. So we'll take the predictions, average them together. But SWA is saying, we can actually take the average of the weights, which, which is what I find kind of cool about the, the paper. Um, so the paper in the title is saying, finding wider optima. So what does that mean and why do we care about it? Um, so why do we want wider optima? This is a diagram from the paper that I think is a good illustration. Um, is basically on the left, we have train loss. On the right, we have test error. Um, and then the Xs represent different points in the weight space. Uh, and so if you look at the X that's to the farthest right in the diagram, I think this is the best indication of why a wider optima um, could be better. Because you see this X here is in the optimal point for the training loss. But you see it's actually moved like pretty far away from the best place for the test error. Uh, and it's because you see that basically the optima for the test set is smaller, is within the optima for the training loss. And so ideally, you know, we'd want those to be the same or very similar. And basically the wider the, that optima for the test error is, um, the better chance that by optimizing the training loss, we can also basically put that X in the, uh, the spot for the test error in kind of the, the space there. Um, and so the natural question is, like, as we're kind of going through uh, these iterations, 
does SWA, stochastic weight averaging, actually manage to find wider optima? And here they did a pretty, I think, a pretty neat experiment to try to uh, show that SWA is finding wider optima. And basically, um, one one way you could test like how wide is the optima that my model has found itself in is you take one of these points, so one of these wherever your model is stopped, and then you can start stepping out in random directions in the space. Uh, and so in this case, they picked 10 random directions from the final model weights, uh, and you start basically perturbing the weights in certain directions, uh, and then you measure how does the test error change. Um, and so the theory being that if you're in a wider optima, it would take a greater distance of actually perturbing those weights to make a difference in your test error. Uh, and you can see from this graph that when they perform the experiments using um, basically the averaged model, they found that it, it is situated in a, a wider optima than you would get through gradient descent. So you would have to travel a much farther distance in the weight space to um, make SWA perform at the same test error as uh, gradient descent. And so I, I think that's a kind of a neat illustration of basically, you know, they had this theory. I mean, you know, sometimes people have techniques and they test it and it works. And then you kind of have to come up with theories of, of well, why does this work? Uh, but in, in their case, they actually had a way of starting to try to illustrate the actual dynamics by which it was, uh, it was actually doing what they thought. Uh, and so in terms of results, um, this is another reason why I was drawn to this paper. Um, they performed a number of experiments and across a bunch of different models and data sets, um, including VGG and ResNet, but then some other ones, um, like a wide ResNet pyramid net. Um, so some newer architectures, as well as some of the, the classics. Um, the data sets used were kind of from small to large, so CIFAR 10 up to ImageNet. And they also tested using kind of fixed learning rate schedules, as well as cyclic learning rates. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of experiments they did to try to see, does this actually work? Uh, and so there's a couple of tables from the paper. Um, and so this is comparing some of them, um, VGG, ResNet, Wide ResNet. Um, and basically, they compare a standard SGD training, which generally they took from the papers that uh, propose these models or, or kind of the best that these models have done and then their FGE paper and then explain the budget thing basically um, they took one budget to be the standard training for SGD and then they did basically 100% of that and then 125% and 150% basically of what you would normally train it for uh, stochastic gradient descent and you can see even at like Kind of one to one in terms of uh, training time with SGD, uh, you still see uh, it getting better results on like both of these data sets. And the theory is also that SWA could let you train for even longer. So once you bump it up to uh, you know 1.5 budgets, you're still seeing uh, improvement. Whereas in SGD, you might have already kind of tailed off. Um, the other interesting thing is they did some tests with pre-trained models as well. Um, and so basically the way this would work is, you know, you imagine the pre-trained model is in a pretty good spot in the weight space already, but by performing this SWA, you can have it kind of move around that space and then take the averages of the models that it, it kind of finds through that process. Uh, and you can see that they also had some uh, improvements on an already like kind of say the our pre-trained image net model. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the implementation because um, this is kind of the fun bit for me. Um, so I last year made a commit to fast AI to kind of add this as one of the options in, in training. Um, the callback was pretty simple. I will say this is the pre 1.0 callbacks and they have revised it and uh, putting this together, I've been kind of inspired to, to pick up work on making a 1.0 version again. Um, but basically, the, the callback, like I said, is, is pretty straightforward because the algorithm is, is pretty simple and elegant. Basically, um, once you've, so you, like I said, you're able to set a threshold, basically, when do I start actually 
taking the average of these um, models. So once you've gone beyond that, you're going to update the average model. You're going to increment your count of models in the average and increment. Uh, and I think like some of this uh, metadata tracking, I think, is already done for you in, in 1.0. Um, and then the update average model is also a pretty straightforward implementation. Um, you have your parameters of your model, you have your parameters of your SWA model, which is the copy you made at the beginning. Uh, and then basically you go through each of those parameters. And um, this is this is a code for the running average. So you basically multiply it by the number of models you already have. You add in the data from the current um, model. And then you divide by basically the number that have already been averaged in plus one. Uh, and that's that. The batch norm fix is kind of funny. Um, so this is one of the kind of trickier parts of getting the implementation right is with batch norm, um, basically because at the end you end up with this model that is the average of the weights of several models, the batch norm weights aren't going to be right because batch norm is basically tracking um, statistics on the data as it goes through the network. But the network you have is an average of weights. And so it's never actually seen any of the training data like for that particular set of weights. And so the way to fix this is when you actually want to perform inference with your SWA model, um, you want to run one, uh, you don't want to do one whole pass over the training set in training mode and that will basically update those statistics. So that's one trick to actually like implementing it. Uh, in terms of testing it, um, you know, I did some functional tests. And, and in this case, it's just basically, if it's seen two models, this is actually averaging the weights on three and so forth. And then also some experimental tests. So I did some um, re-implementation to see if I can match some of the results. And uh, so this is kind of the results from the original paper the results I got uh, after running it, and uh, they were pretty close, uh, and in general showed the same trend of, you know, SWA with even one budget can outperform SGD, and then kind of as you add additional training time, it can kind of continue to improve. Um, so yeah, just to just to wrap up, then um, I just wanted to shout out a couple other papers. If this stuff is interesting to you, um, there's a couple things that have come, there's the first two are things that have come out related to SWA. The other one is a paper cited in the papers um, that kind of takes you in an interesting direction. Um, so this one is, there are many consistent explanations of unlabeled data, why you should average. Um, and so basically this is um, applying SWA in a semi-supervised setting. Um, so as opposed to, um, you know, with CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, the experiments in the original paper were done fully supervised. Um, this is trying to apply it to semi-supervised learning. So you only have, uh, you know, a small amount of labeled data. And it also proposes a, a kind of tweak to SWA called fast SWA, um, which is supposed to converge more quickly than the original method. Um, this is another one applying SWA to um, kind of Bayesian uncertainty. Uh, so basically, you're, because uh, SWA, you're kind of going through the weight space, tracking these parameters, and in the end, you end up with an average of the weights that you've seen. Um, the idea of this is if you can take that average, but then you also uh, keep track of like the second order, um, second order moment, I think. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but basically, you can use it not only to get an average of the weights, but then also an uh, estimate of the uncertainty of your uh, predictions. So this is kind of an interesting extension. Uh, and then from this the, one, sorry. From the weights themselves, the average weights themselves? Yeah, so, and, and like I said, this one, um, I didn't have, I didn't, wasn't able to totally dig into this, but it's basically, in SWA, you have the average of the weights. And then basically, if you track um, kind of one more thing, you'll end up not only, because you want, in this case, you want not just the mean, but also kind of the uncertainty of that estimate. And so if you track like one other thing while you're doing the SWA process, um, it gives you an ability at the end to not only make the predictions, but also have some estimate of uncertainty. Um, so yeah, the, the, I, I just found this paper today actually, and uh, 
it seems pretty neat, especially if you're kind of interested in more of like Bayesian methods applied to deep learning. Um, and then this last one, which was cited in the, the FGE paper, um, but I think it's really cool just because of these diagrams, is basically visualizing the lost landscape of neural nets. Uh, and this, I think, came out in 2017, but it basically was kind of a novel way of, of getting accurate or even more accurate visualizations of what these actual space. So we're talking about these spaces and um, kind of traversing them, but what do they actually look like? And so this was one where I think on the left, it's without skip connections. The right is kind of the ResNet model with skip connections. And you can see it's like a lot smoother. And so they gain some kinds of insights into those things. Um, yeah, just a couple links. There's the paper. I wrote a blog post about this and kind of the process of putting it into fast AI. Uh, so there's the fast AI code. Um, the authors also have an implementation. It's up on GitHub that's in pure PyTorch if that interests you. Um, yeah, and that's that's basically what I have. So open it up to any uh, any questions. Cool. Oh, there's a question in chat from Srinivas. Uh, Srinivas, if you want to ask that via voice, feel free. Otherwise, I can uh, read this one. It's asking, the stochastic part of weight averaging seems to just originate from weight averaging of stochastic gradient descent weights. There's no stochasticity in the averaging itself. Is that correct? Yeah, that, I think that's right. So basically, I mean, the stochastic part of the name is just because you're doing it through SGD. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, there's no kind of stochastic part to the averaging. It's basically at, at the end of each epoch, once you get that kind of candidate model, you just throw that into the average. Um, yeah, so I don't think, yeah. And do you have a sense for um, the kind of the uptake on this in the fast AI library? Like there are things that Jeremy talks about all the time, like the learning rates uh, cycling and stuff like that. Is this something that he is recommending folks to, to use or may, is it like, uh, do you see it becoming a default or something like that? Yeah, I would say like adoption Adoption hasn't been extremely high, and I part of it, which I I meant to throw into the talk, is it's still unclear how to use it with like uh, one cycle policy, which he he is really fond of, and and became kind of the default. Um, basically, because like I said, with cyclic learning rates, you're basically supposed to average in the models at the bottom of each cycle. Um, mm -hmm. But but you can imagine since it's a one cycle policy, like. In, in essence, you would only have one thing there to, to put in your average. So, and, and, you know, the authors didn't necessarily anticipate that, like research and that that might be a way people train. They kind of only proposed it for like fixed learning rates and also for kind of more standard, like multi-cycle. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's an open area. I mean, if someone could combine them, you know, that could be interesting, but, uh, Charles, was yeah. that the question you were going to ask? Yeah, kind of. I mean, this came up with Jeremy Howard on his um, Twitter the other day that he was noting that when you try to mix learning rate schedules, when you try to adapt the learning rate schedule, batch normalization seems to cancel the effect out. And he was trying to, he wanted to explain this to his class and was looking for an explanation. I was, uh, it wasn't clear. I mean, I, it, it, it kind of looks like things we used to do in physics where you just simulated annealing. And mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you had any insight into that because I noticed that you were doing the the uh, you know the cyclical learning rates, but you were also had the batch norm on. I was wondering whether the batch norm would screw things up. Yeah, um, but I mean, really, in terms of the paper itself, like the only thing they get into is, like I said, the kind of tricky part with the batch norm is that the mo the final model you end up with from SWA you need to reset those statistics. Um, right. but, but in terms of like impacting the training, I think, I mean- So they, that, they used the batch norm with the cyclical learning rate and they had no problem. Yeah, they, they didn't seem to have an issue. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, their baseline was based on like other people also using batch norm and cyclical learning rate. So it could be, you know, it could be you, you can beat that learning or you can beat that baseline now with, with some additional kind of insight, but they kind of just took that as the standard and 
and compared it against that. Yeah. Right. Right. Gotcha. I, I think it was the, yeah, it came up in the context of weight decay behaves like adjusting the learning rate schedule. Oh yeah. I think, I think I saw him tweeting about that the other day. Right. And I, I didn't comment on this. I was going to say, well, you know, in physics, weight decay is related to temperature and batch norm would be like temperature control. So if you have temperature control, you obviously could not turn off the temperature if you're, if you're in a heat bath. So it, it's, this stuff's kind of hard to understand because it, like the theory is kind of like kind of wishy-washy, yeah. but it, I, mean, it, I was just yeah. curious about that. I think that's the tricky part you get into when you start trying to combine things is like, each of these papers kind of made some incremental improvement and had some theory for why it was able to improve right. over what existed. But, you know, you throw two or three of those techniques together and, you know, sometimes it ends up really well. And I think there's like, there's that bag of tricks for image classification paper that came out that's kind of putting, piecing together a couple of them, but yeah. it's not always Wait. guaranteed that you're able to synthesize them in a way that kind of gets you the benefits of both. What, what you would expect in, in a more traditional method is that when you do averaging like this, it looks like you're computing a free energy. So you have an energy, mm -hmm. you set a temperature, you compute the free energy, the free energy convexifies the landscape. That's, it smooths it out. That's exactly what you would expect. But these are not like variational free energy methods. They're these weird things that we use. So I, right. that's what I was wondering. I don't see any insight either. I'd have a, you know, I don't know how to, you know, I know what it, I know what it is in traditional methods and these methods, I don't have a clue. So it's, I don't know, even, so that's very interesting though. It's a very interesting paper. Yeah. And it's, it's great that you implemented it. Yeah, it was. Oh, uh, that's the best part. It was, part. It was yeah. a fun project. I, I definitely enjoyed that bit. Cool. And like I said, the, the algorithm simple enough, but still effective. So that was kind of the neat part. What are you implementing next? Well, like I said, I have to do, I have to do SWA for the hey, one. Dollar? For V1. Um, beyond that, I guess uh, I guess I have to keep my eyes open on Twitter and see what else people are sending out. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for William? I think that's the mark of a, a great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you answered all the questions. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it and, and learned a little bit of something. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Good night. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye.